In this video, we're going to introduce consolidations for financial accounting and reporting. This is an area that is known to be heavily tested on the CPA exam. We're going to start off this topic by answering the questions, who do we consolidate? When do we consolidate? Why do we consolidate? And how do we consolidate? Let's start off with who do we consolidate? The key here is control. We consolidate entities that we control. Generally, we have a parent company at the top. Then underneath come the subsidiaries that the parent controls. The financial statements of everyone that parent controls gets consolidated together with parents' financial statements. How do we get this control? We can acquire control directly or indirectly through a business combination. Note, a business combination is a transaction where an acquirer, who we'll call the parent, acquires control over another business. Generally, we get direct control when we own more than 50% of the voting rights of a company. Usually, common stock has voting rights and preferred stock does not. If you own 51% of the voting rights and I own 49% and we go to a vote, you win every single time. It doesn't matter whether you own 51% or 99%. It's the same voting control. Even with 51%, you still win the vote every time. Well, if you win the vote every time, then you effectively control the company. Because in the end, you win all the votes and the company has to do whatever you, the controlling shareholder, decides. Just remember, whatever equity or stock you get must have voting rights. We don't care about non-voting stock because it's the voting power that gives you control. Note, there are certain exceptions where a parent owns more than 50% of the voting stock and still does not have control. For example, when a subsidiary is in bankruptcy. Once a company goes into bankruptcy, as a general matter, all major business decisions require approval from the bankruptcy court. In that case, it's not the majority shareholder that makes the decisions and controls. It's the bankruptcy court. Another example is when someone has veto power. Not that kind of veto. The kind that gives you power over a vote. If the majority shareholder wins the vote, but there is another shareholder with the power to veto that decision, well, then the majority shareholder doesn't really have control because every decision is subject to that other shareholder's veto power. Another example are foreign laws. Certain countries restrict outside ownership and control over their country's businesses. If a foreign country's law says that outsiders cannot control its domestic companies, it doesn't matter whether we own 100% of the company. If it's illegal for us to control, then we don't have control. Looking at these examples, you can see that each of these are the same in that they're all situations where a shareholder owns more than 50% of the voting rights, yet it still does not control the company. The key here is effective control. Now let's look at indirect ownership. This is when a parent owns more than 50% of a subsidiary through other companies. Let's look at a situation where a parent owns 70% of the voting rights of X. X in turn owns 60% of the voting rights of Y. Whose financial statements will be consolidated with the parent? Well, X for sure. Parent directly owns 70% of X. And ownership over 50% means control. Parent definitely controls X. The question is whether parent controls Y. Because parent controls X, it doesn't matter whether parent owns 51%, 70%, or 100%. It all means the same thing. Parent wins the vote 100% of the time. And that means control. If parent controls X and X controls Y, then parent also controls Y. Which means Y also gets consolidated with parent. Let's try a multiple choice question. The question reads, for purposes of consolidating financial interests, a majority voting interest is deemed to be. Before reading the choices, let's form an answer. It's asking, in the context of consolidations, what is a majority voting interest? We know that for consolidations, ownership centers around control. That means we need more than 50% of the voting rights. And ownership can be direct, indirect, or some combination of the two. With that in mind, let's go to the choices. A. 50% of the direct or indirect owned outstanding voting shares of another entity. This is close, but we need more than 50%, not just 50%. A is out. B, 50% of the direct or indirect owned outstanding voting shares and at least 50% of the direct or indirect owned outstanding non-voting shares of another entity. What's wrong with this choice? Do we care about non-voting shares? No. Consolidations is all about control. Non-voting has no control powers. C greater than 50% of the direct or indirect owned outstanding voting shares of another entity. 
This one fixes the thing that was wrong with A. It changed 50% to greater than 50%. This looks like the answer. Let's read the last choice just to make sure. D, greater than 50% of the direct or indirect owned outstanding voting shares and at least 50% of the direct or indirect owned outstanding non-voting shares. Once again, we don't care about non-voting shares, so C is our answer. When do we consolidate? We consolidate beginning after the parent acquires control. So if parent acquires control over the sub on June 30th, we start to add in the sub's revenues and expenses beginning after the acquisition date. Parent bought on June 30th, then parent starts to reap the benefits after the purchase. Why do we consolidate? The parent and sub are separate companies with their own separate financial statements. During the year, parent maintains only its financial records, and sub maintains its separate financial records. Only when parent has to present its financial statements, usually at the end of the quarter and year end, do we create consolidated financial statements for the parent. These consolidated financial statements include numbers for the parent and all the entities that it controls as one economic entity. This in substance is what they are. I keep saying consolidated financial statements. What does that mean? In its simplest form, it just means you're adding up the parent's numbers and the subsidiary's numbers together. For example, cash on the consolidated balance sheet will be the total of the parent's cash and the subsidiary's cash. That would be consolidated cash. The complexities come in when we have to make adjustments, and that brings us to how do we consolidate? Let's look at the sample consolidation worksheet. Here, we're consolidating the parent with one sub. The first column gives us the account names. The second column provides the parent's account balances. The third column has the subsidiary's account balances. Some of these consolidated accounts will be just that, adding the parent's balance and the subsidiary's balance together. But other accounts require some adjustments. If that's the case, we put those adjustments into the columns entitled Consolidated Journal Entries, Debit and Credit. Then in the last column, we add up the balances for the parent, the sub, and any adjustments made. So just to summarize, we consolidate those entities that we control. Control is the key. Once we get control through a business combination, we consolidate the subsidiary's revenues and expenses with the parents right after the parent acquires control. We don't include the subsidiary's numbers from before acquiring control. Next, the parent consolidates each time it issues financial statements. Generally, that's at the end of each quarter and year end. Lastly, keep in mind the picture of that consolidation worksheet. It's just about adding together the account balances of the parent, the sub, and including any adjustments as needed. Next up, we're going to start to dig into those consolidation entries with a simplified three-step process. You'll be rocking those consolidation problems in no time. So stay with me. I'm Liz Cho with Test Prep in a Snap.